Yes, and elite sports around the world have struggled to make space for transgender and gender diverse people. This is in, in recent years. The issue of inclusion has led some organisations to be tied up in knots. Uh, so to help sporting organisations across the country to uh, adopt an inclusive approach for people in the LGBTQIA sorry, LGBTQIA plus, I forgot the important one, uh, community for this story. The Australian Sports Commission has released a set of guidelines developed by the Australian Human Rights Commission. And the message is simple. Inclusion is the core of the sporting spirit. Every sporting club from grassroots to elite competitions is being urged to adopt the guidelines and make the changes to stop discrimination and inclusion. Kirsty Miller, is a decorated former international athlete, a transgender woman and an advocate for transgender issues in sport and joins us now. Hello there, Kirsty. Hello, how are you, Lindsay? I'm very, very well. And some of your sporting achievements, either on the uh, on the footy field or in the pentathlon, began here in Wollongong as well. Absolutely. My pentathlon career kicked off in, in um, Wollongong. I was very lucky to get to train with Robert Barry, a, a four-time Olympian, a Wollongong boy. So I got to live down there for a few years while I was getting into the pentathlon and I love the place. Like, that's my second town, you know. Pentathlon, so what, running, swimming, there's shooting as well in it as well. Yeah, there's, um, the original pentathlon when I did it was running, um, cross-country, the swimming event, the pistol shooting, the fencing and the show jumping on a horse. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and I, I actually got to travel around the world with my own pistol at like 14 years of age, travelling around on trains in Europe for months at a time with my gun and my swords. And <laughs> When you were 14? <laughs> yeah, and I was actually detained in Czechoslovakia, Prague, while I was in year 10. They found my gun in my luggage and thought I was a terrorist. <laughs> and I'm saying, no, I'm a year 10 student from Wagga Wagga. <laughs> Like, let me go. And I was like 14 year old kid. Uh, all right. Well, with my gun and my sword and my saddle. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the olden days. Look, I, you have done a lot of stuff internationally, that and of course, uh, and, and playing rugby league here as well. But for people who haven't witnessed this firsthand, like yourself, talk about the, the different challenges that transgender people face when trying to get into community sport and also moving through the ranks to elite levels. And I'm, I'm aware that, uh, you know, this, what we're speaking about now, was sort of pre transition for you. Yeah, well, to get into sport, like, it's been a problem, like, for many years because there hasn't been clear guidelines for a lot of sports, you know? And that, so a lot of trans people and a lot of sporting organisations don't have a clue and they've had to invent the wheel as we've gone along. And luckily here in Australia, we've started inventing this wheel seven, eight years ago when we've developed around 25 different sports policies. And this is actually our second lot of federal guidelines. We developed the community guidelines back in 2019. But like, the challenges for people is it's very much in, in the media these days that we're getting vilified. Um, they're painting trans girls in sport as big, strong, hairy-legged monsters that are going to come and take over all these women's sports. But that's not what is happening. That's not men playing sport. It's trans women coming along and applying for the game. And they don't just let like my former self, Warren, turn up on Monday and play for the Matildas on Tuesday. You know, there's a process that goes through of hormone requirements and, mm. and, and assessments. And what this new guidelines here today is going to help because it's clarifying things for sports and clarifying things for the trans and, and the other athletes, you know. So it's a really big step in the right direction. It gives sports and everyone involved all the legalities in it it encourages sports to treat us as individuals, not as a monolithic community. That's a big take out yeah, of this. And, and is that important because the idea, I guess, of asking whether trans athletes have an advantage, uh, specifically biological advantages, that question is is flawed, isn't it? You can't sort of ask broadly about that. That's like asking how long is a, a piece of rope. It, like, no community, cisgender men, cisgender women, trans women, we're totally not a monolithic community. Like, between the the tallest and shortest trans women or cis women or, or cis men is, you know, a couple of feet and there could be 50 kilograms difference in weight. So this here treating everyone as an individual, we must look at each person individually, holistically. It's treating us as 
one person. You know, it, it makes total sense. There seems to be few people saying things like, uh, you know, that, well, as you said, they're going to be stealing all the gold medals from people who were born biologically women. But is there any case for that at all? Well, this year is actually going to help things along the way for both fairness for both sides, because a lot of people don't realise that, and it's been in the law for about since 2013, that if an athlete comes along a trans girl to play the game, Sports have always had the ability to discriminate against that individual trans athlete if they have this disparity in strength, speed, endurance and or physique. And this policy here now come out re-clarifies this point that it's actually against the law to adopt the policy like a blanket ban like World Aquatics have done. No sport in the world restricts the natural occurring testosterone levels of XX females. The thing is, XX physiology are 10 to 20 times more sensitive to testosterone and we've got about 17 percent of female athletes which have got high testosterone there's a lot of mythology in sport about endogenous tea and a lot of the mythology has been bought by world athletics they've told a lot of lies about mm. testosterone so it's, it's a really good thing the ais new policy it is totally in line with the new olympics gender framework developed in 2021 it mirrors that exceptionally well like it's a really good thing it's, yeah. it's world's best practice from a, a nation i believe well yeah kieran perkins says it, it offers the clarity domestic sports asks for this is the thing a lot of people think that you will hear the 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 the, the right side of politics and say that they'll call the australian institute of sport woke because they've thrust mm. this policy on sports well that's not what happened every single sporting club in australia has had little trans people in their communities you know Mm. And then for years, this isn't a new thing. Like, we've been playing community sports in Australia since 1976, and we've never had a state champion trans person, you know, yeah. in any sport. So sports were crying out, Lindsay, to the governing bodies, please help us. How can we let this trans person feel welcome in our club, but also ensure safety and fairness? Mm. And what are our legal responsibilities? This isn't politicians required. This is actually sporting people crying out to the head of sport. The head of sport brought together a team, a team of cisgender, transgender, medical, legal, human rights experts and had a consultation like our 2019 policy was a two-year process alone. And then this one again now, like it's a really good thing. Speaking to Kirsty Miller, who has played so many sports, how will this impact the LGBTQIA plus community? Well, it's life-saving and that is not without any exaggeration at all. I'm a co-founder of Australia's largest online mental health group that we've got on social media. And after World Aquatics banned us, blanket banned us, without studying a single swimmer in the world, mm. not even a trans girl, no one. There was no studies done. They had a popularity vote. I had trans people suicidal. I had a young trans swimmer, young little young child, wanted to die that night, you know. So this here is going to say, we're welcome, we're welcome. And, and, and it's a huge thing. Because only 12% of trans youth play sport compared to 70% of cisgender right. youth. Yeah. That's the massive thing, you know, and we've got special health needs that we need sport. Like, there was a big review come out recently, Lindsay, looking at bone mineral density. As a community, transgender people have got lower bone mineral density than cisgender men and women even before we start this treatment. And the reason for that is we suffer homelessness. Mm. We, we suffer unemployment rates at a higher rate. We get youth homelessness and we don't get to partake in sport. So all that stuff is related to bone health. So it's very important. This is a life-saving policy, what they've done. And it's not going to create a tsunami of trans champion athletes. Like, becoming a trans woman, no matter what, it mitigates your, your, your performance, Lindsay. Yeah, what did the you say? You're a Lamborghini body, but broken like down. You're Lamborghini running on really, really bad fuel and, you know, like yeah. instead of having a V8, you've only got a four-cylinder engine. Yeah. So you might look big, but bones don't move. Muscle mass moves and, and mm. hemoglobin moves. Like it only takes three months for a trans woman to go from male-level hemoglobin to female level. That is massive. That That is the difference between endurance levels. Mm. When, when I transitioned, I lost 11 seconds over 100 metres freestyle in my first year. No, which is almost double the gender performance gap. Right. And I was I, I was a world champion. 
It's, it seems like you have become, uh, as well as your sporting career, also become a an encyclopedia on on the science of trans people in sport as well. Well, Lindsay, not many people fully understand this, and the only people that fully understand are the people that have lived and breathed it, and the people that have lived and breathed it as elite athletes are very, very unique. There's only about half a dozen of us in the whole entire world. Mm. So. I was an elite athlete by 14 years of age, representing Australia in two sports. So an athlete notices the slightest alteration to their chemical makeup. Well, these guidelines uh, developed by the Australian Human Rights Commission have been released by the Australian Sports Commission, um, an inclusive approach for people in the LGBTQIA plus community. Kirsty Miller, very good to talk to you. And um, maybe we'll see you back in Wollongong if you want to restart your uh, your footy or your uh, pentathlete career. Oh, definitely. I definitely. I've definitely got plans to get back to Wollongong and actually like to retire there one oh, day. Yeah. I mean, Broken Hill's yeah, fine, don't get me wrong. I mean, you've got the Mad Max Museum. I miss the Taraji pub. <laughs> I love the Taraji pub. <laughs> yes, true. you got the Mad Max Museum, we got the Taraji pub. <laughs> <laughs> I love that place. <laughs> Kirsty Miller, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for speaking to ABC Illawarra today. Thank you and great to talk to you, Wollongong beautiful people. Love you all. And, of course, um, we have some important phone numbers to give out um, because we did talk, uh, touch on some pretty important and, and some pretty serious subjects there, uh, including that of, uh, of mental illness and mental health. Lifeline, 13 11 14. Kids Helpline, one 800 55 1800 or kidshelpline.com.au and QLife 1-800-184-527 or QLife.org.au and of course if you or someone else is in immediate danger call triple zero ABC Laura is where you are conversations spend an hour